but you don't have to build a game to be playful, and I don't think that's going to suit a, lo a lot of your organisations. Um, but you can actually do little small things. So these two examples show playfulness in, in the small bits of the content, what some people call micro-content. And I think they're good examples of what the hotel industry calls delighters. So a delighter is an aspect of a product or service which delight the customer, but they're not strictly required. So here you'll see um, just simple things, right? To say that we're going to read every single word. You know, this doesn't feel like it's just a piece of, um, you know, it actually feels like they're talking to you. This Zen one is, um, I like this link down the bottom. Um, oh, wait, I remember. You know, so if you've gone to the forgotten password page and you suddenly, uh, you know, go, oh, that's right, it was that password, you can easily get back. Um, and there's lots and lots of examples of these kind of delighters. All these examples, sorry, are not from government, but... Um, Kind of cheating here a little bit. Uh, Photo Jojo is a uh, their cart is kind of an interesting example. So not very happy cart, <laughs> but when you add something, happy cart. <laughs> and you're probably familiar with Wufu. I think Wufu is a really good example of having personality on your site. Um, so again, putting a dinosaur next to your login button might not be appropriate for your website. Um, but have a think about it. What other ways that can you delight people? Um, and here's some more examples of Wufu um, personality there. A parting is such sweet sorrow. Are you sure you want to log out? Yes, I need to leave. You know, it's just, it does have a personality to it. It makes it more fun to interact with. Anyone played with Facebook's pirate version? It's good times, it's good times. <laughs> Maybe suitable for the fisheries, Ministry of Fisheries. Yeah. Right. So yeah, have a think about it. In what ways can you delight users? Are there, are there any ways that you give us, users feedback on their actions in terms of a score or a rating? You know, can you create a game? Can you be playful with that micro-content? So in conclusion, my intention today was to hopefully leave you with a few um, examples to go and check out, maybe um, inspire you just a little bit. Um, but there's no denying that, that you guys work in a pretty challenging environment. Um, for example, in, in our experience, Design and research techniques aren't used strategically uh, at public sector agencies. They're often used um, in an ad hoc way right at the end. Um, uh, yeah, that happens quite a lot. Um, I think many government departments have a shared accountability model. I've talked about this before. I think that when, when something is owned by everyone, it's owned by nobody. So the idea of having a single person who's in charge of all those citizen-facing channels, I think, is, is crucial for creating a great experience. Um, and competing priorities um, often means that web teams at, in government departments are quite small, um, they're under-resourced. And, you know, given that we know that well-implemented public sector um, websites can improve efficiency, offer convenience to all New Zealanders, advance democracy, it, yeah, I think they still don't get the money and, and the people that they deserve. Uh, probably the biggest challenge with all this stuff is that, is that the government culture is not one of risk-taking and creativity, generally speaking. Um, and I think, you know, in some senses that's rightly so. As, um, as this guy Jeff Mulgan points out, the only way to have good ideas is to have lots of ideas and discard the bad ones, but you cannot afford too much creativity with benefit payments, traffic lights, school curriculums or court procedures which I think is a very good point. As an owner of a small business, I can go out and do wacky stuff and there's little risk, um, really. I'm, I'm not going to, if I break something, I'm going to break it for our staff or our clients. I'm not going to break it for the citizens of New Zealand. Um, but I do think we have to rethink some of the ways that, um, that government encourages innovation. Um, and I, particularly in my mind, innovation is about speed and about iteration. And I think that particularly government procurement processes um, discourage both of these things. They're not, they're not agile. But in New Zealand, we do have this huge opportunity. We've got 80% um, of people aged 15 years and over have used the internet in the last 12 months. And New Zealanders, on the whole, are pretty happy with e-government. This is from a survey in 2008 that said that 71% of Kiwis are satisfied with getting information online from government, which I think is actually really, it's great. We've, we've kind of got a good base here. So in summary, how do you get a perfect website? You can make it attractive, social, open, useful, playful. All those things sure help, um, but let's be honest, there's no magic formula here. It takes a lot of hard work. I think we need to acknowledge that we live in a world that's complicated and loud and messy and filled with real people. And our attitude should be one of thoughtful innovation. Um, I think we need a mix of research and design uh, techniques to help ensure that we create websites that, that rock. 
So I thought it'd be useful to have a couple of next steps for you if you're interested in learning more about um, the state of the play in e-government or how to apply psychology to your designs. So this UN report that I mentioned earlier makes for a really interesting read. Um, if you just Google e-government survey, you're, you're going to find that. Um, I think they used to run it every two years. I'm wondering if they run it more frequently now. But that's, um, that's well worth a read. It's got lots of examples of different websites from around the world there, um, as well as kind of giving you a general feel for, for what's happening. Um, kind of as a whole. Um, these two books are really interesting. Um, actually, this one's not out yet, um, but Neuro Web Design and Designing with the Mind in Mind um, are both books written by usability people about applying psychology to design. So, yeah, they're well worth a look. You might want to check out this website as well. This is really interesting. This guy called Stephen Anderson has created all these cards to help apply some um, of these psychology techniques to um, to web design. So he's created little cards as little reminders. So pattern recognition, you know, our brain set ways to organise and simplify complex information even when there is no pattern. And then he kind of talks about how you might apply that to web design. So they're just like, there's 52 of them. So just great ways to remind yourself of some of these principles as you go about designing sites. So I well recommend you check out that. That's um, getmentalnotes.com. One final point, my business partner Salish likes to make this joke, what he call curry in India, food. It's not a very good joke. Um, <laughs> so in a similar way, I'm looking forward to the day that um, you know, public sector websites become so useful and so intuitive if we just drop the E from e-government and just call it government, which is what it should be. And that's us. So hopefully that was a, um, gave you a couple of things to look up, a bit of... Um, uh, yeah, some things of interest there. Um, one more thing before um, we open up for any questions. We're running a usability toolkit course in July if you're interested in a whirlwind introduction to, um, to usability techniques. Daniel Zook from Hong Kong, um, who some of you may have been on his earlier courses when we've brought him over, uh, will be running that for us. So that's going to be in July here in Wellington. I don't think we've got the dates pinned in quite yet. Um, but yeah, let us know if you're interested in that. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Appreciated you coming along this morning. See you next time.